Welcome to the MHPN Working Better Together online conference. I'm Dr John Cooper, consultant psychiatrist to the Centenary of Anzac Centre and the chair of today's discussion. The Centenary of Anzac Centre provides free advice, consultation and support to practitioners nationally who work with veterans with mental health problems. Specifically, our practitioner support service provides case consultation and access to a team of multidisciplinary experts for advice specific to your inquiry. We have access to consultant psychiatrists, psychologists, general practitioners, and social work family therapists, all very experienced in the complexities and challenges of veteran mental health. Today, you will hear these experts as they discuss a current case consultation live and work through the best treatment options, evidence-based research, and practice and how to integrate this for a better clinical outcome. The case is a fictitious composite of the typical cases that have come to the practitioner support service. When cases come to us, they are de-identified in order to protect the privacy and confidentiality of uh, the veterans concerned. So let's get started. Participating in our consultation today is Jane Poole, a social worker and family therapist, Richard Bonwick, a consultant psychiatrist, Jeff Thompson, another consultant psychiatrist, Phil Parker, a general practitioner, and Christy Heffernan, a clinical psychologist. For those on our call, you would have had a chance to read over the case notes. So that everybody is on the same page, I'm going to introduce the case now and we will then get on to our discussion. This is a case that exemplifies the complexities that often are associated with veterans and their mental health issues. And it's certainly quite typical of cases that we have assisted with. So the referrer is Judith, who is a clinical psychologist working in private practice with multiple years of experience with veterans. She is trained in trauma-focused therapies, specifically prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy. She's working with a 42-year-old male who joined the Army in his early 20s and was a rifleman for two years before being medically discharged. He has disclosed to Judith that as a child he was sexually abused and that his father was a cruel man his mother abandoned the family when he was 11 years old and he felt responsible for his two younger sisters. He also shared that he was relieved to be medically discharged from the army and that he was doing very well until the last few years. He has worked for a building company since his mid-20s and is married with two teenage children. Now, we have a lot more details that we're going to discuss, but I, I wonder with that initial introductory information. Uh, Jeff, do you have any initial thoughts when you hear that uh, level of detail about what might, uh, what might be going on with this chap? Uh, thank you, John. Jeff here, psychiatrist. Um, well, look, I think that uh, this, this case, as you said, is a, a complex and challenging case and, and also not, not an unfamiliar case at all. Um, the combination of early life challenges and um, time in the army, um, it's interesting that he was, he felt a sense of relief to be medically discharged. Uh, but it does seem as though uh, following that time he's had a, a period of good functioning. He's, um, you know, it sounds like he's had stable employment, he's married, he's got two children, um, so up until this point in time, uh, it would seem to appear that things are actually going quite well. It's John here. Yeah, so it, I guess, raises in my mind the question of why now, but let's get some more information to see whether we can uh, help clarify uh, what might be going on. Several years ago, Judith's client began the process of applying for DVA compensation entitlement. He found this process very difficult because of having to revisit the experiences he had while serving and felt like he was not being taken seriously by advocates. He thinks this is the point where he began to unravel. At this point, 
or just after this point, he attempted suicide and was admitted to hospital. Since then, he has made another two suicide attempts. Part of his discharge plan was a referral to Judith for treatment. Besides the initial disclosure of abuse as a child and negative experiences during the army, he refuses to recount any further detail of these experiences and threatens that he'll stop attending their sessions if he's forced to talk about it. I think that's another point for us to sort of reflect um, on what might be going on here. And I guess uh, in terms of an attempt to do trauma-related psychological work, Christy, what are your thoughts about why a veteran might be so adamant that he doesn't want to do this kind of psychological treatment? Thanks, John. It's Christy from Sydney, clinical psychologist. It's an, it is an interesting case, but again, not uncommon with regard to somebody um, who's you know, had something happen in their life, which seems to be the the um, going down at the DVA compensation route and having to then start bringing back memories of things that have happened in the past that um, we're already suspecting a, a pretty traumatic memories potentially for this um, particular client. And, and it's not uncommon then for people who've got a trauma history or a potential trauma history that they've not necessarily talked about or, or um, openly sort of even thought about potentially for many years because they're probably engaged in, in quite a bit of avoidance behaviour around that. So avoidance of any thoughts, avoidance of any um, situations or people or places that potentially um, have triggered those memories. Um, and so those memories have, have sort of laid dormant for, for a while. So that, that avoidance um, behaviour and um, avoidance of those trauma memories is pretty common in cases like this um, and potentially those um, the trigger of the DVA claims has really start to started to unravel um, this particular client and his ability to then actually um, potentially regulate his emotions around those memories. Thanks Christy, it's uh, John here again. So I guess part of the take home message that uh, uh, you would be giving to Judith is not to be surprised about this avoidance and uh, start thinking about strategies to manage it in order to proceed. Yes, let's get back to the case then, Christy. Um, the, the main presenting difficulties include intrusive memories and nightmares, which are obviously reflective of his PTSD, and low mood, irritability, and daily suicidal ideation. So in addition to his depression and PTSD, past treating psychiatrists have noted borderline personality issues. The client has tried multiple medications, but they have had very little effect. He sees the same GP because of his wife's insistence, but feels the GP doesn't understand his military background and has his own agenda. The veteran is aware that his wife speaks to the GP about him and attributes this to her own attempts to seek support. He has noticed that his wife and children are growing more distant and feels remorse that his actions are driving them away. He thinks they would be better off without him. Now, as a psychiatrist, um, I'm always enormously grateful when I have the benefit of uh, a multidisciplinary uh, set of colleagues to uh, mm -hmm. help in this situation. And I think here we've got some really important issues that relate to uh, a person um, attending a GP but also some family and social issues that um, I'd be interested in your thoughts, Jane, about uh, the impact that that's likely to have on the work Judith wants to do with this veteran. Thanks, John. Uh, Jane here, social worker. Look, I think that there's a few issues in here and um, and certainly working from a family inclusive practice and um, encouraging Judith to talk with her client about the family situation and where that's at. I guess one of the concerning things that I have here is that in terms of suicidal ideation, we would usually consider family and children as a protective factor. Um, and for this particular client, it could actually be a risk factor in terms of his family being more distant from him. Um, so I think some exploration around that um, and encouraging Judith to do that would be really important. Okay. Thanks, Jane. And uh, Phil, I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, when you hear that a, a veteran is concerned that his GP doesn't understand the military culture that he's coming from. 
Um, yeah, hi, this is Phil here. From a general practitioner perspective, I think um, it, it's, it's disappointing to see that he has not developed a strong connection to, to the GP. And that may be part of his strategies to avoid confronting his issues. But it, to, to obtain the best outcomes for these type of patients, it's important that we consolidate a team approach to, to give these patients the best support. And often that surrounds the, the holistic uh, work and support of the GP. I think in this case, it's important that we look at that relationship and try to find out what his concerns are, why he cannot connect to the GP. Um, if he thinks that the GP is not invested enough in his care, then maybe uh, we need to communicate that to the GP or look elsewhere because um, th this is essential to building the foundation of, of his care. What do you think about the issues of he and his wife both seeing the same GP? Is that potentially uh, an issue and might he be better off having his own GP? Uh, potentially, yes, but I think I think there are pros and cons to it. I think um, it, it can be better in terms of developing his trust. It might be more appropriate to look elsewhere, but if you have a general practitioner who can who can manage that well and has a has a good insight into the issues, then uh, then, then it has the potential to work well. But for him personally, at this stage, he his emotion stays quite fragile, and it might be worthwhile considering whether he would be interested in changing GPs in order to to, to build that connection. I agree with with you, Phil. I think there's some pros and cons in um, in uh, you know, staying with the same GP or or changing GP. I guess that the other thing is that um, the information that we have is that the veteran is aware that his wife speaks to the GP about him, and attributes this to her own attempt to seek support. So um, I, I'm thinking that if his wife needs support, um, then maybe you know maybe Judith might be able to. Um, in some way, have some contacts via the client to the wife to link her with her own support system. This is Phil here. It would be interesting to, to determine what uh, the veteran himself thinks about his wife talking to the GP about him. Um, it's, it's really important in these cases that, we, that the, the patient her, uh, is autonomous in their care. And he may feel uh, it's being managed externally, uh, which is which is sort of counterproductive towards getting him to be motivated. Yeah, it's Christy yes, from yes. Sydney here. I probably would also um, concur with that sort of uh, the wife probably needing her own support, and I'd probably suggest to Judith that um, maybe Open Arms is a is a good counselling service that, that the wife would would have have access to as a, a partner of an ex serving veteran. So. That would yep. be a good yes. um, avenue for her. Yep, Christy, I, I agree. Um, and um, she would be eligible through Open Arms, so that would make some good, mm. some, some good sense. Yep. Uh, John here. I, I, I think there may be some uh, people who uh, haven't um, uh, been aware that Open Arms is now the new name for what used to be the Veterans and Veterans Family Counselling Service. So we used to refer to that as the VVCS. So the VVCS is now open arms, and I agree that that would be uh, potentially an excellent uh, resource that would be freely available to this veteran's partner. Now, I'd just like to uh, give you the last uh, piece of uh, information that uh, we have with this, uh, this case, uh, and that's the very important um, aspects around Judith's response uh, to her work with this veteran and how she's managing that. So uh, Judith has sought supervision about this case from another senior psychologist, but doesn't have any clear direction moving forward. She's been trying to engage her client in trauma-focused therapies for several months now, but isn't getting any traction. She reports feeling lost and powerless and is considering referring on, but is concerned for the client's safety. His triggers for self-harm include feelings of rejection and abandonment. He continues to attend their weekly sessions, but there is no defined treatment goal, only that they are working towards helping him feel better. So to reflect on this case, we've got really important issues around risk. We've got uh, a very complex situation, both in terms of the day-to-day uh, the -day practical issues, but also diagnostically. Uh, we've got uh, family issues, we've got a service system that is uh, struggling with this chap 
And we've got a therapist who is uh, well motivated to do good evidence-based treatment uh, for PTSD, but we have uh, a veteran who appears to be engaged and that he's attending, uh, but very reluctant avoidant to do uh, any trauma-focused work. So there's a fair bit there for us to, uh, to talk about in terms of the advice that we'll give Judith. Um, who would like to, uh, to, to dive into that uh, set of complexities? Uh, Richard, a uh, psychiatrist here, just to, to uh, try and pull all that together. I, I think the, one of the key issues with this veteran, he's probably still in the middle of his uh, compensation claims, which is a very unsettling mm -hmm. thing and seems to have de destabilised the whole situation. I, I think in these circumstances, the key is really establishing trust and uh, to move mm -hmm. beyond that is probably pushing the boundaries a bit too far. He seems motivated and ready to engage. And I think that needs to be the focus, is developing a trusting uh, therapeutic relationship before any trauma-focused work is actually considered. Christy from Sydney here. From the clinical psychologist's perspective, I'd be advising Judith of the same um, on the, along the same lines, Jeff, that really agree with you that trust needs to be the foundation here and um, often go when veterans go through the DVA system, it can really rock their sense of, of trust and safety in the world. Um, and so we want to you know, encourage Judith to establish a therapeutic relationship that build, rebuilds that sense of trust um, that potentially his client has lost, but also to rebuild his sense of safety. Um, and stability um, and once that sense of safety and certainly once the risk around um, suicidal ideation and the um, reduces then then you know I would be suggesting that trauma focused therapy is appropriate but until that risk is is stabilized um, and until that trust and safety is developed in the therapeutic relationship um, I wouldn't advise that trauma focused therapies um, uh, it, it particularly going through imaginal exposure and, and potentially even the in vivo exposure at this stage, but really just focus on emotional regulation strategies to decrease his risk. This is Phil here. From a general practice perspective, I think I agree. Um, it, it's it's small step to, to building uh, good outcomes, and in this case, it's it's uh, it's good to focus on the foundation of his care, which is which is is his support. Now we know. We know that he's already engaging with a psychologist. We don't know whether he is getting that funded through DVA because he certainly does have an entitlement to non-liability health care. So he's entitled to a DVA white card for mental health support. Um, and, and that way, you know, the financial burden of, of, of his mental health care is, is no, longer, um, no longer a problem. Mm. We, we certainly need to enhance therapeutic relationship with, with AGP. Uh, and we need to widen his team to give him more support so he's got greater protections. There's there's a note there about medications, and and I'd be interested to know who has been prescribing that medication. Um, so so that might be a, a question that we should we we could ask. But we need to know a bit more about his family functioning, about how strong that relationship is, whether he has good social support, you, you know, be it through mates or or even um, organisations mm -hmm. outside, and whether he is quite stable at work. He, you know, he's been, he's been out of defence for what twenty years now. So, and um, it seems to me he's quite successful. So, and that might be a protective factor. So, it'll be interesting to explore that a little bit more too. Thanks. It's Jane here. I agree. Um, I agree, Phil. I think that um, that that that's all really really important. Um, and I think you know the fact that Judith has been able to establish a relationship with this chap, and has he is attending sessions every week mm -hmm. is a really positive thing. Um, and that gives Judith the opportunity to be able to potentially work with him to improve his support network, to check in with the family. I'd be interested in knowing how his teenage children are going. Um, you know. Whether things are going okay for them in terms of school, um, what sort of support this chap's wife um, has or needs, and what kind of support the family um, and potentially the children have and need um, as um, as well. And I think giving Judith the feedback that um, what she's doing is a really is a really good job. And um, whilst um, at this point in time it's kind of not the right time to be looking at at, um, at, at any trauma therapy. Foundation work is really important um, for any future treatment that this um, that this chap might need. Yeah. 
Jeff here. Yeah, it's good to see that we're all on the same page and all in agreement. Um, I, you know, I would endorse everybody else's comment, but I'd actually like to highlight the fact that um, we've really got quite an acute and unstable and uncontained uh, situation here. Um, you know, he's had an inpatient admission. He's had three suicide attempts in a period of time, and I'm not sure exactly what period of time, and he's got ongoing suicidal ideation. So we've, we are really dealing with what is still quite an unstable and, and acute um, clinical picture. And I think one of the priorities, there's a, there's a couple of priorities in terms of making sure we've got a good risk management plan in place. I think it, there's some uncertainty here about how we put all of this together, what the various contributions are. Uh, there may be some issues around diagnosis that are not clear. So I think it's a priority that um, developing a, a better understanding both at a, a diagnostic and formulation level and management plan is, should be sort of the top of our agenda. And I think because of the complexity of the case, um, I think uh, we should be supporting Judith in that there's a lot more here than she can possibly expect to do on her own. Um, I think looking at the GP issue, as we've talked about, but um, this is not an advertisement for psychiatrists, but I think that there's probably an um, important role for a psychiatrist here. Um, it's yeah. a complex case. Um, there's some uncertainty around medications now. That might be a compliance issue. It might be that uh, suitable medications weren't trialled. It might be that um, uh, maybe the, the, the trials that were given were not adequate, or maybe the expectations of the the um, the patient were beyond what we can expect medications to do. So I'd be really keen to make sure that uh, we are shoring up sort of a multidisciplinary uh, treatment team. And I notice in the in the case that uh, Judith was part of his discharge plan, and I'd I'd be interested mm -hmm. to know what else was part of that plan. Um, are psychiatrists yes, still involved? And if if not, I think we should get one as a as a um, priority. Jeff, it's Christy here from um, a clinical psych perspective. It's certainly what I would be advising. One of the first things I would be advising Judith is kind of not necessarily managing um, a client that that it has this sort of risk profile and needs a risk management such a comprehensive risk management plan. Never to try and manage that on her own as a clinical psychologist. That really needs to be part of a multidisciplinary team. And agree, she's got this referral um, as as he's come out of of hospital. So whether or not um, you know, asking the questions of does he still then have a, a treating psychiatrist? Is it the psychiatrist from the inpatient facility, or you know, does he have? Um, I noticed in the notes that there there has been a, um, a past treating psychiatrist have noted um, personality issues and also questioned PTSD and depression. I'd want to know where that information was coming from and how long ago that that was. But certainly it needs to have a current treating psychiatrist. Um, probably in the case and, and connected with that GP too, Phil. I think that's really important. And I note, Jane, too, that you mentioned that, you know, the, the family, given that um, they're sort of distancing themselves, that that's sort of becoming a risk factor for this client. So we'd, we'd probably be interested to hear if there's any kind of family interventions or something that, that perhaps we could um, point Judith in the right direction to try and um, improve that as a risk factor as well. But, yeah, certainly multi team is totally required in this case. It's John here. Can I be um, a little bit bold and um, maybe reading between the lines uh, suggest that uh, Judith has possibly uh, landed on the wrong formulation? And again, I'm, I'm bracing myself for uh, my uh, colleagues on the panel to shoot me down. But I wonder whether what he's dealing with here is in fact somebody who's got quite active borderline personality issues that have been um, exacerbated by the stress and significance of his uh, compensation processes and um, that uh, the focus of treatment, I wonder whether should be primarily uh, on those sort of borderline personality issues um, to try and make sense of the risk to try and uh, make sense of the need for uh, everybody to be on the same page. So um, 
what do you think? Do you think I'm barking up the wrong tree? It's Jeff here. Uh, uh, I don't necessarily want to take you on, Don, but um, I think that this is a really important question. I think that there are some indicators there that certainly raise it as a possibility, the, you know, the childhood trauma and the cross-sectional picture as we see at the moment might be suggestive of that. And my only reservation about it is that he had a long period of time of relatively good functioning. Mm. And some that can happen. You know, it can be quiescent and it's only when stressed or, or challenged and, you know, the, the mm. memories of the past perhaps coming forward can activate um, some personality issues. But that that period of good functioning does raise a question in my mind as to whether or not that's the case. And that's where I think getting a better understanding of what a, what the formulation actually is. Um, I, if that is the case and if that is playing a significant role in the presentation, then the sort of uh, therapies and psychological interventions should be geared towards that. And that would add to the sort of the containment uh, that we're looking at and the building of a, a relationship and trust um, mm -hmm. if that was the case. I think that there's a... There's another possibility here too, which is that there may be um, a significant depressive uh, picture going on that may be lost in the midst of everything else. And my reason for thinking that is that there's a, a number of sort of nihilistic themes about uh, his family being better off without him, um, and that might explain why he functioned well for a period of time, and, and the picture we're seeing now is actually quite different. Um, so again, with the information that we've got, we can't really answer these questions, but I think it, it does add, uh, again, weight to the, the need to have a very sort of clear diagnostic and uh, uh, picture and an and a accurate formulation. Richard here. Some, some of that may have occurred during his uh, multiple inpatient admissions, and I, w I would hope that uh, all those who have been treating him are in communication Certainly accurate diagnosis and good formulation is the key to treatment, and I guess, John, you're just raising some, uh, some possibilities there. You would hope with three acute psychiatric admissions, some of that's been explored, in, including collateral history that might uh, give some uh, weight to a, an underlying personality disorder diagnosis. So I think it would be important for any treating team members, and particularly for the clinical psychologist in this case, to try and liaise with the uh, the inpatient treating team and see what, what additional information had been obtained during these admissions. Phil here. I think I think we also need to ask questions about other contributing issues or factors here, such as, you know, what, what level of alcohol uh, use mm -hmm. is, is, is being, uh, is involved here, whether he's relying on um, substances to, to allow him to function. And like more, probably more pertinent, to his service history, does he have any comorbid conditions? You know, is he because um, we don't have that much history about his his military experience, although it was only a short period of time. You know, does he have any ongoing pain issues or, or other contributing uh, physical injuries? How's his sleep going? You know, we need to ask these types of questions. Yeah, Jeff here. I agree, uh, Phil. I think that's really important. He may not be prepared to talk about um, his experiences in the army, but we could at least ask him about what the diagnosis was for the basis of being medically discharged. And that might give us some, mm. some clues, uh, but it may not. And Christy here from Sydney, Judith may, may have some of that information already. So we'd probably at this point going back to Judith to, to kind of get a little bit more information because she has started some trauma focused therapy. So she, she must have, um, does she have an idea of what, what she's focusing on? I agree, we need to go and um, get that more information from Judith. Um, but on, back on the, um, you know, the, the question around borderline, I agree that there's, there's pro probably a lot of information that Judith can get from the stays um, that he's had within the inpatient facility. Also, you know, that um, John's right in terms of the, the, the abandonment that, um, that occurred early on in his life, as well as um, the childhood trauma, childhood sexual abuse. Also, that what can happen when veterans go through DVA and, and having to go through the compensation system and being questioned and, um, you know, can bring up um, feelings of abandonment then as well um, that perhaps 
potentially they're not telling the truth. Even though he was relieved that he got medically discharged from the military, that can often happen that people are relieved about being medically discharged but um, can still feel somewhat abandoned by that discharge process. So it can, can be a bit destabilising. So DVA process might have um, uh, brought up those that, that abandonment stuff again. Jane here. Um, contributing to that is, uh, you know, this chat was um, the, the information that we've got from Judith is that his mum left the family when he was quite young. Um, mm. He was only 11 years old. He had a really cruel dad. Um, and he was also in a position for caring for his younger siblings. So there's, um, there's a lot uh, in terms of his family of origin that um, Judith may already have the information, but, but maybe just trying to get some collateral around. That might give us a clearer picture um, or give Judith a clearer picture diagnostically as well. Mm, great. It's John here. Can I, can I just back up a little bit and ask you, Christy, um, we don't know from the information we have at this point whether uh, this chap's PTSD is related to his military experiences or his childhood trauma. Um, if it was one or the other, should that change the, uh, the nature of the psychological approach? It's a great question, um, John. It, John. It depends. It depends. Determining what, um, look, going down further uh, in the trail after we've, um, you know, this particular client's suicidal risk has been reduced and you might revisit trauma-focused therapies again, um, deciding on, on sort of which trauma um, to work on is a really interesting kind of, of, of dilemma. Um, what we would usually focus on is the um, the trauma that the client would, would refer to as their kind of worst trauma. Um, and the reason that we do that is because it's it's important to uh, um, address the trauma that kind of is at the um, that kind of is at the centre of the emotional and um, and you know cognitive kind of um, difficulties for the client. So um, it, it, it a lot of that happens within collaboration with the client, of course. Um, but yeah, Judith would have probably I would be talking to Judith about this, she would probably have a good sense of, of where um, where that sort of uh, index trauma or the, the worst trauma, if you like, um, where we'd need to work on. So yeah, it, it does make a huge difference and it, it's very much part of your formulation of, of how to um, try and reduce the impact of the traumas that, that somebody has had in their life and, and try to do that in the, in the best, most effective way for the client. Um, it's John again, Christy, and uh, I, I'm sorry, but you've, you've provoked this next question. Would your approach be different um, regardless of the trauma if you were confident that the patient with PTSD also had borderline personality structures? If I did think that the borderline um, factors were there, I would um, be very keen to make sure that um, that we'd, we'd addressed emotional regulation skills, that I felt like they, that he would have the ability to um, be able to, to manage his distress, increase his distress tolerance um, quite a bit more because, um, you know, when we're doing trauma-focused therapies, um, what are the, the one thing that, um, that I would sort of stop trauma focus therapy for is, is if these risk level had increased again. So in order to try and try and manage that, I'd make sure the emotional regulation skills are really um, honed in. That's what would be um, how I would manage um, the active kind of idea of borderline personality in this in this particular case. It wouldn't stop me from um, potentially visiting the childhood traumas. Um, that wouldn't stop me at all. It wouldn't necessarily mean that I'd just focused on if, he, if the trauma was related to his military service, that I would just do that because he was in his early 20s when that occurred. Um, but certainly I would be um, very, I'd, I'd have to have a fair bit of confidence that he'd have um, good emotional regulation skills before we did the trauma-focused therapy. Thanks, Christy. Now, I'm a little bit conscious of time. I was wondering whether there were any other thoughts or comments that uh, you would like to make before uh, we wrap up this case and uh, decide what it is that we're going to feed back to Judith. Jeff here. Um, there are a couple of quick comments and I'll make them as quickly as I can. Um, thinking about Judith and, and her situation, um, 
you know, very briefly, I think it's important to emphasise to her the, the importance of ongoing supervision that might be geared towards helping her to work on her management plan, etc., but also dealing with the impact on her of dealing with uh, working with such a difficult uh, and complex case. Mm -hmm. Um, I also noticed that um, you know she's reported feeling sort of lost and powerless, and perhaps something for her to explore in her supervision is whether or not that's hers, or whether or not she's picking up on the patient's experience, which comes from their past traumas, etc. Um, but one important um, thing to, to also highlight, and this is something I think as clinicians we often wrestle with, this this notion that perhaps what might we what we might think is in the patient's best interest in terms of their their treatment but being concerned about how our, our our patients are actually going to respond to that and that's that's always a tricky situation personally i think that it's important that we make the best clinical decisions that we can and if if it seems that that is going to have some risk associated, then we develop a, the best plan we can to, to mitigate that risk. So if Judith doesn't feel that she's got the skills to uh, provide the sorts of therapy that she concludes that uh, this particular man wants, then she should be supported in her efforts to refer on, but be encouraged to look at what ways that she can actually do that to minimise the risk of uh, feelings of rejection and abandonment. But we don't want that to prevent her from uh, pursuing what she thinks is, is the best treatment options. Jeff, this is Phil. Do you think it would be worthwhile, Judith, um, asking the patient himself what he sees as, as, a, as an effective outcome, as, a, as, a, as an ideal outcome for him? Phil, look, I, certainly in the way I work, I always try and make it as collaborative and open and transparent as I possibly can. And uh, I think if you, you can get him on board with being engaged in deciding, you know, strategies and approaches and, and you know, what his objectives are, I think you, you're going to start to build that trust. And I think more often than not, that's a very uh, beneficial thing for both the clinician and the, and the patient. It's still, and I suppose once we get him a bit more involved in his own care, he might be more motivated to accept, um, accept some of our suggested um management approaches. Jeff here, yep. Um, and, and in particular, he's, he's much less likely to feel rejected or abandoned. Uh, Jane here. Um, I guess the other thing that I was just thinking is I wonder whether it would be worth having a conversation with Judith to ask the client whether it would be possible for maybe Phil to contact, um, to contact the GP. Um, to have a, um, a discussion with the GP because that would also maybe allow Phil to find out a little bit more information about um, the other family members, um, including including the wife and how they're tracking and um, and how they might be able to be supported. Thanks, Jane. It's John here. So let me just summarise uh, what we've discussed and I guess a decision that we would make under normal circumstances is to uh, decide which of us uh, is then going to carry this case forward and uh, liaise with Judith around this case. And I imagine that it would probably, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe Christy as a fellow psychologist, would, would this be a case that you'd be happy to, uh, to pick up and do the um, uh, legwork with Judith? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, no problem at all. Good. Okay, so we have, quite a complex case. We have significant risk issues. Um, we have um, difficulties uh, engaging in the type of therapy that is, is deemed most appropriate. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I hear a saying that we would support Judith in continuing what appears to be a more supportive type of therapy, particularly while risk is uh, significant and uh, the complexity around the formulation is being sorted with a view to uh, including the, the veteran in the decision about timing of changing tack to a more trauma focus. But it's also apparent that there's a lot of information about uh, what's happened uh, with this veteran in his past and certainly in relation to his past treatment 
and we would be looking uh, to converse with Judith about getting that information if she doesn't already have it, so that we can further refine our formulation and uh, provide some ongoing support for her with this uh, difficult case. So thank you to all our experts for your contribution today. Thank you to those listening in today. When you contact the Centenary of Anzac Centre Practitioner Support Service for advice, we take your veteran mental health question or problem, we consult with our experts just like we've done today, and we will provide specific advice back to you and ongoing support related to that. This is a free service and you can access this service through our website at all the W's, anzaccentre.org.au, or call us on 1800-VET777. Thank you very much.